time to have some questions at the end. So like it to be interactive. I told him, I don't know how I'm going to talk for 60 minutes. I probably have some, some ex girlfriends that say that's not a problem, but I, but I, uh, I got, I got my water. I'll try to keep it. I'll try to keep it interesting. And, um, you know, I'm really here as a resource. I think one of the things you'll hear me say today is it's a lot about access. And so one of the things that I'm really grateful for is that I'm able to give people access to people at my position and know how lucky I am to be here. And I'm happy to, to, uh, to share that with you guys. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, and I'm very excited to have this conversation with you today, Sean. Um, you know, we have a lot of talks between ourselves on, you know, what needs to be done to um, improve access to, to funding um, to minorities and women, you know, across the board. But before we get into that, um, can you maybe just give us a little background on who you are, where you came from, and how you stumbled into VC land? <laughs> yeah, the good, uh, the good, uh, I like that verb, stumbling. So I definitely stumbled into VC land. Uh, and so I'll, I'll try to take you back. So um, I never heard of VC when I went to college. So I went to a state school in New Jersey and venture capital was not a major that was a, that was available um, and nothing that, that I heard about. So I knew that I could talk and I just got a business degree and I said, I want to be in sales. And uh, you know, that turned into, I got a job um, in mortgage sales, didn't know what it was, but it paid the most money. And you know, that's when I started uh, in 1998. Um, and so I went to work for a company and they trained me, I, which was great. They just trained me how to be a salesperson. And it was really the start of my career is that someone actually taught me a profession because they don't teach you how to be a salesperson or network or do anything. That's not a college course either. Uh, <laughs> but networking is such a, such a big skill. You know, when you, when you get out, I, I, uh, there's not, it's interesting, just sales in general. There's no college course, there's no college major, which is sales. And yet people just end up in sales. And they say, how do I got here? And I'm like, I have no idea, right? Most people. <laughs> so uh, I did that for a bit, but I was quickly learned it was one of 700. And I said, okay, well, I, I think I'm a pretty good salesperson, but I don't, you know, no one's ever going to notice me, right? So how do I, how do I go get noticed? And one of the things you'll always hear me talk about, Jeff has said this too, is be intentional with the things that you do in your career. Right? And I was always intentional. I said, okay, well, I'm pretty good at the sales thing, but I'd be a better salesperson if I learned like operations. So if I know operations and I might be better in sales. And so I picked up and I was ready to move to New York. It was the summer of 2001 and then 9-11 happened. I said, uh-oh, <laughs> probably not gonna move to New York. Uh, I probably should have done it, but uh, I moved to Chicago and um, I went and found a job in operations and I was like, great. So now I have operations and okay, when I want to be a manager, I was 25 and like, no one's going to hire you to do that. So I was like, I just went into my boss's office and I said, I think I'm better than the girl that's doing it now. Can I have her job? And he said, we're not real happy with her anyway. Um, you can have the job. And I was like, great. Now what do I do? Right. So I, I managed some people for a while. Um, I started moving up and started being intentional in the things that I did or the classes that I took. And I spent a bunch of time outside of work learning things that I didn't know. Mm. I didn't, and Jeff's heard me say this before, I didn't want barriers in my way for someone to say like, no, you can't do this. And if they told me no, I went and studied how I could become an expert in those things. And so I did that for you know about 10 years and then the crash happened in 2008 and everyone got fired in my industry. So I had to figure out what to do next. And um, so I went into, I said, what am I good at? And I said, I think I'm good at managing people. They kind of like me and but I need to find a new industry. And I was always interested in tech. And so I said, let me just try to find a job there. So I ended up with a sales manager job in technology. And it was interesting. Um, you know, again, I was good at sales and I was good at managing. And then I said, well, what don't I know? And I said, well, let me figure out if I can like work with our developers because I don't know anything about coding, mm -hmm. right? And so I started working with them. I started doing all these other, these other things. And again, it was intentional because I just didn't want anyone to tell me no. And I really didn't know what I wanted to do, but I just didn't want to be told no. So as you can tell, I'm a little bit stubborn. So um, it was in tech um, and 
you know, I started moving up and managing more and more. And then I got into a business development job because I said, I'm good at sales. I'm good at operation. I'm good at management. Let me go do like strategic or enterprise sales. And so mm-hmm. took a job there and all along the way, it was about how do I network with the right people? Right. It was mm-hmm. always, this was pre LinkedIn, you know, it was like, how do I always get to the, to the right person? And, I, and what I tell people that I mentor is like, it's not always your boss. It's your boss's boss is probably the one that, that, that has more influence or is higher up. And, and how do I get to those type level people? And I just ask people like, will you be my mentor? Mm-hmm. <laughs> so here's my, my stubbornness coming through again. And most people will say yes, if you just ask them, um, cause it's sort of an honor for them to, you know, to do it. And here's the reasons why. Um, you know, how I think he can be helpful to me. And then I took a, you know, I had this job at a Silicon Valley company. You guys may have heard of DocuSign. Um, Oh, wow. Yeah. And I was running business development for them. And one day I was out with my boss and I met this woman and she said, uh, I said, what do you do? And she said, I'm an investor. And I said, what do you invest in? And she said, you guys said, I'm on the board. <laughs> and I said, uh, can I buy you a drink is what I said. <laughs> and I said, cause I just want to pick your brain. Right. So like, how did you get here? What did you do? Like, I haven't met female investors that like, you know, that are the board of this big company. And we just started talking and I said, you know, like, I don't know anything about venture capital, but here's what I'm good at. Can, can you use me? And she said, sure. And I said, I'm willing to do anything free time, whatever it takes but I want to come work for you one day. She said, okay, here are the things that you need to, to do to, to do that. And um, I went to work outside of that and, and figured out what I needed to do. And I said, when the time's ready, I'm going to come back and you, you won't be able to tell me no. So you yeah. can see the, com- the, the common thread. And that's, that's how I ended up where I am today. Didn't know what venture capital was, didn't know all that stuff, but I just like, I wasn't, in, I wasn't, and I wasn't going to let anyone tell me no. And then I, I knew if I could get here, then I could help get access to other people. That yeah, you know, and um, and just uh, just so because you know, obviously I know, but just so that the crowd um fully understands, can you maybe just tell us a bit about where you're at today? You know, what you're doing at Modern Ventures, and also what Modern Ventures does. You know, maybe the size of the fund, how many deals you guys are seeing yep. a year, where you guys are investing, etc. Yeah, so we're a venture fund out of Chicago. Um, we have two funds. First one was about forty-five million. This fund's about a hundred million dollars. Uh, And we're typically a series A fund. So like what series A means to, you know, means to people is different, but we'd say companies typically from 2 million in annual revenue to 10 million. And Mm -hmm. typically check sizes that we would write is somewhere between a million and $7 million, depending upon. Now we may go earlier, we may go later, uh, but that's typically like what venture funds will say is their buy box. It's like what, what, what we tend to do, and it's B two B software, um, B two B or B two B to C, and it uh, very we like horizontal uh, software companies that are um, applicable to a lot of different industries. And the reason that that's important is a lot of our LPs and you know investors are in the real estate space, so some mm-hmm. of the biggest real estate companies of the world. And when you're very secularly focused like that that real estate industry is very, it's cyclical, right? We just saw, you know, no one would know that a pandemic came around, but I told you about 2008 and I told you, you know, there's, there's, there's cycles. And so if you can set up a company and we'll talk about this later, that serves multiple verticals, say if you're in healthcare or say, you know, you're in real estate, you know, you may, you may have a better chance of having a bigger total addressable market. If your software is agnostic to industry and you can serve multiple industries. So you see companies, like Slack as an example, right? It doesn't matter what industry in, everyone's got to talk to each other, yes. right? So, so that I would say, you know, we can talk about that a little bit more, but certainly that's how I got to where I am and, and uh, you know, the fund that I'm in now. And my job is to manage the portfolio. And so we have about 70, 70 portfolio companies and I help them with growth and scale, so. Yeah, no, that's that's amazing. And that's amazing work that you guys are doing at Modern Ventures. And um, can you maybe speak a little bit to the current landscape um, of the VC space, right? Like what are VCs looking for? Are there any areas where you feel like, you know, um, there's a lot of deals happening, ed tech, um, real estate tech, et cetera? Yeah. So 
I put a few down, which I, I think are, are uh, interesting. Um, I, I, I look at med tech a, a little different, like certainly there's, there's medical tech going on. One of the things that we are looking at is just the aging demographic and technologies around that. And whether that's aging in place, um, you know, we have the baby boomers that are, you know, going into healthcare and into health facilities. Uh, and so I think there's a lot of energy and effort being put on where do those people live? How do they live, stay in their homes? They typically have money. Uh, and so a lot in the healthcare space ha has gone, uh, a lot has just gone into that space. I just talked about companies like Slack or future of work. So how do I, how do I enable either work from home or community, you know, or sort of uh, community in, in the workplace? Because uh, we're all going to have some type of either we go back to the office or some hybrid or some work from home. And so how do, how do we have tools that enable the sort of new workforce or whether it comes into the gig economy, lots of people won't go back to work and they'll, they'll be in gigs. So you've seen a lot of people addressing that big marketplace. Uh, I would say cyber is a big space, right? We're all working from home and, Absolutely. and th that means more, more hacking. Um, and real estate for sure. And I also talked about, we're seeing a lot of funding in infrastructure, renewable energy. So just you know, the term ESG. So a lot of stuff around sustainability um, and then financial models in helping consumers either, you know, we see buy homes, get credit, you know, when, when you have, when just like in 2008, you're gonna have people come out of this economy and a lot not in the best shape, right? And so yeah. how do you how do we help enable credit to keep moving? And so we see a lot of fintech type of type of startups um, addressing addressing those models. But it doesn't mean that that not everything's open. I think this those are some of the big trends that we see. Yeah, no, no, that's that's some good um some good points. And on the flip side of that, what would you say is the the landscape like for fundraising from a um entrepreneur's perspective you think now is maybe the best time i'm seeing i think there was like we had the a, a record year in 2020 for vc funding well that's a that's a two-part question so i tell people the best time to ever fundraise is now there's more what we call in the industry dry powder or sort of capital to be invested than there's ever been um but we know the stats especially for this group um only 2.6 percent of funding has gone to minority uh, folks so 2.6%, I'll say that again. So 2.6. Um, so that number is low. So we can say it's the best time to ever raise funds. It may not be the best. I still think it's the best time for anyone to raise funds, no matter where they come from. But there's lots of improvements to be made. And, you know, the stats just bear. You know, we are at this intersection of a political climate um, and a social climate and a financial climate where there's a lot more attention being mm -hmm. focused. Um, and there's only one place to go, Jeff. We talk about this all like, you know, from 2.6%, that's not the num, you know, that's not the percentage in proportion to people of color. Right. Yes. But, but that how, that's how so we could talk about some initiatives later, but I would tell you there's just more money being available. Maybe we'll talk a little bit later on how to access that money. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and, and before we get into how to access it, maybe um we can kind of just get into the meat and potatoes of the talk today, right? And um with that number being so low and kind of like the odds being stacked against um founders of color and um fee women founders, um, how would you say, like, you know, what would you say is step one for just like approaching a VC or just trying to get capital for your business? Yeah. Um I would say there's a couple things. I just think general points for people to, to understand. And I, I sort of put it in a few different buckets. I put it in preparation and then I put it in access. And then I think it's execution. Like those are the, the way that I think about it for any founder, but especially for those that haven't raised. And I think you have to sort of set the context of how minority founders typically think about funding. So yeah. You know, I, I did a talk a few years ago at the National Association of Hispanic Realtors, and they said, and it was all about access to capital. And the Latin community is a little bit different. 70% of small businesses are funded by the family, right? So mm -hmm. 
it's not even about going to the bank, right? People don't trust the bank. They trust their, their uncle and, you know, and it's a very cash, um, you know, sort of heavy culture because that's what happens. You keep cash in the house, it's hidden everywhere and, and, you know, and you help family when families need it. And so, you know, we were trying to talk about how to access institutional capital because that's the way it typically happens. And it's not just Latins that do that. It's very, it's a very minority way of doing, doing business. You, you go to who you trust and you don't, you know, you may not trust the institutions, but there's only so much cash you can put in the couch, right. Or hide under, you know, you, at some point you need to get, uh, if, you know, if you want to get millions of dollars, we typically don't have access to, to those types of things. So I think just in general, it's, it's a little bit of a culture change. And I think younger generations just talking to like, what are the preparation things that I need to get ready? And some of those things are as basic as like do you, doing your taxes. <laughs> like people are like, I'm not telling, I'm not giving you my, ta I'm not giving the bank my tax information. Right. And that's just a, just a, like a, a distrust right? That's been built up for a long time, or I need legal documents in place. Well, I don't know. I don't even know how to do that. And you know, this, we talk about like, do what kind of corporation? Do, am I a sole proprietor? Am I an LLC? Am I an S corp? And like, just the preparation to start to talk to an institutional um, entity has been the challenge. Like, so forget going to raise money. <laughs> it's I'm not even I, I don't even have the right structure. So I think a lot of it starts from the preparation and how to get yourself structured and getting the right resources to say, how can that not be a barrier when I go in? Because I talk to companies like we can't even invest in your corporate structure. And they're like, I don't even know what you're talking about. Right. <laughs> and so we can't even start to have a conversation about your product or you or anything else, because I can't even, you know, that's it's not even an ability. So I think there's a lot of education around preparation. And just what are the things that I need structurally and financially to just get to number two, which is access, right? And so when we get to access, we typically go to people that we know. And like once we exhaust, you know, Uncle Joe or whoever else, you know, the one person that, that may have money in the family or the two people that may have money in the family that everyone's hitting up for money, they're like, don't ask me anymore, right? We've all been there, right? So <laughs> we all know we all know who that person is. And so now when I talk about being intentional, you have to start with who is your network? Who is, and then who is your network's network? And who is, who is your network's network, right? And so you have to get a little bit further away and we'll, maybe we can talk about this a little bit later, but it has to start early and you have to get into groups and we can maybe talk about some of those groups. But, so I think access is one. And then just for all founders, I have to raise money as a VC, right? And so I have to go ask people for money too. And we have this thing when we have to do that is there's this insecurity of I've already failed before I've started, right? They're going to mm -hmm. say no to me before I even walk in the door or I'm never even going to get in the door anyway. So, you, you know, we almost have this defeated attitude where I've been down this path. I don't want to get kicked in the teeth again. It's happened over and over and over and over again. So I'm just not going to try. I'm going to put my hands up and like, I'm just not going to do it, right? So... I call it just, it's founder insecurity, but it's based in in reality. Um, mm -hmm. And if you are a minority founder, it's even worse. Yeah. <laughs> right. So it's exacerbated. Um, but you have to get, you know, you still have to try. You got to get, you know, you're going to get told no. It's not. It happens to white founders. It happens. It happens to everyone, right? But it. But it, you do have to. The more you can be prepared, and the more people that you have access to, then. You know, hopefully the more chances you get at that and the more chances you get at that, the, the, the more likely it is you get hit, right? And we can talk about some of the things that that you need to do, and I'll go into a little bit more detail, but, you know, to me, those are the three areas that, that you have to you have to start the intentional. Yeah, absolutely. And that, and that makes a lot of sense. And this, just to recap for the crowd, right? So you're talking about the first part is just like having your um, business formation properly set up, right? Or your business yeah. properly formed, right? So an S corp or an LLC, but typically VCs like S corps, am I correct? It, yes, but it depends. Like it's, it's not about, um, I mean, there, there are different ways to structure businesses. And so, you know, I don't want to, everyone has different ideas in the way, you know, and how they're going to form companies. So I won't say one over the other. Um, 
One's more expensive. S corps definitely more expensive. Um, there's tax implications to S corps versus LLC. So, you know, I would just say that when you are ready, we, we at least give you some help, and you talk to an expert, and they can help you decide what's going to be the best. Okay. No, that's good. That's good. And so here's a scenario, right? Let's just assume someone that's properly set up. They have a product and market. They have business traction, which is something for um, a lot of tech founders of color, you know, they have everything in place, but they still can't quite get funding. You know, can we maybe talk about, you know, how someone who's in that space um, should be approaching fundraising or even when they're in deals, how do they negotiate the right deal? You know, people might be coming from a background where, uh, okay, we have this cool product and we have customers, but I've never ever dealt with a VC, never seen a term sheet, you know? Yeah. So how does someone in that position handle that? Uh, it's like everything else. I mean, I think, I think, one of the, it's so hard to be a founder just in general, right? You go out on this ledge, you, you, you quit your corporate job or you, you do whatever. And then you're like, oh wait, now I got to go raise money in something I'm not even like familiar with. And I've heard all these terms I've never heard before. So part of it is taking the time before you even get to any of these places to educate yourself. And, you know, luckily there are lots of resources to do that. I've been a resource to many founders. I know Jeff is the same thing. We sort of, you know, we have, there's lots of resources and organizations that will, that, that can help you do that. Uh, well, we're part of, uh, yeah, I would say gather as much as you can, learn as much as you can, so you have a base set and then, mm -hmm. and then try to network with, with an expert. And, and that's the, I, I don't think that's unique to venture. <laughs> you know, I don't know how to write code, right? And so if I was ever to go into something where I needed to, you know, do that, I would try to get as much information as I can on my own to be, you know, to be dangerous. I would read as many books as you could. I would get as many publications as you, you know, just so you have a base to get to. And you're never going to be an expert because this is what I do all day. And you're going to do it a few times, hopefully a lot of times. But you know, the first time, if you talk a second or third time founder, so like, man, I just wish I knew, um, you know, some of the basic things to start. And, you know, that starts with groups like this or, um, you know, reading publications or getting into books so you can have the knowledge and then trying to network and getting to the, to the right experts. It's, I wish there was a magic bullet that would say like, Hey, here's a term sheet and here's all the explanations. You know, we're happy to provide that type of education. Jeff and I've talked about, you know, getting getting that um, together, but get yourself a base and then, you know, hopefully talk to, I think another great way is talk to other founders, right? In your network that have gone through the process and say, what did you wish you knew when, when you first started? Like, what were the hurdles? And that's for anything that you do, find your network and see who else has done it and then, Hopefully they can they can educate you and we can walk through those things where I thought we could go Jeff was like. What are the areas that you have to address before you get to a venture capitalist and so yeah. I was I put I was some stuff there. That. You yeah. asked it in a better way. But <laughs> okay. that was in my mind. Yeah, I would, you know, I, I get this question all the time and it doesn't matter whether you're uh, an angel in that, you know, whether you're a pre revenue company or you're, I mean, series C, D, E, I've seen it all down like what does my deck need to look like? Like what areas do I have to address? And so I put a couple down. So the first one I said is problem solution set. Like if you can't explain what the problem is you're solving and what the solution is in two slides, one problem, one solution, <laughs> then you got to rethink the business because whenever you send information, that's the first thing people are going to look at is you know, what is the problem? What is the problem that's here? And as a venture capitalist, not only are we going to say, what is the problem, but are you a solution looking for a problem? Or is this a problem that's very big that lots of people are going to have? And more importantly, are people going to pay for your solution? Right? Mm -hmm. So is there a customer? We always talk about like when blockchain came out, we said like, great, everyone's doing blockchain. Like, what's the problem, <laughs> right? So, right. Um, that was one of the things when it first came out and people had to like work through, is this a solution looking for a problem or a problem, you know, or a real problem to be solved. So I would say, know what your problem solution set is. Um, know your, 
jump into right. this topic yeah. of problem solution set. And I think yep. um, for a lot of entrepreneurs of color, when we're starting businesses, we're not even thinking from that perspective, right? A lot of times we're thinking about passion projects, what's cool, what's hot. And we're not really thinking about, okay, like there's a problem that I can create a solution for that people will pay for. And, um, you know, I, I just want to say, you know, even just starting with that topic, maybe to speak to a little bit like, you know, how can maybe an entrepreneur who's not thinking in that perspective start thinking that way, right? I have people always coming to me like, hey, Jeff, I want to start a, a business, but I don't know what to do. And it's constantly like clothing lines or selling sneakers online or starting a, a, a hairstyling business or whatever, which is all cool and great, you know, yeah. but sometimes the bigger opportunities are in solving problems. Yeah, well, I mean, even if it's pageant passion projects, or even if it's even if it's folding line, it's it's still a problem, right? You, you know, we uh, necessity, right, is is the mother of all invention, right? So like, typically, we're like, this is painful to get done, no one's doing it, or they're not doing it best, or I can build a better mousetrap or all these other like, I have this pain, right? It, so that doesn't mean you know, you have to think about it a, a little bit more as to do other people have the pain? And why is my solution unique or different or people are willing to pay for it? So their brand, their sneaker brands come out every day, right? doesn't mean they're going to stop being sneaker brands, right? But there's something unique about that problem that people are willing to pay for, or at least that's the thesis to start, right? And so you know, I would say it doesn't matter what the business is. You have to be able to explain and extrapolate that problem to a mass audience. And, and this is one of the things that I want to talk about today too. It, you know, just as we talk about venture, not every bit, not every business is venture worthy. And the question is not, should I go get venture capital? The question is, what do I want to get out of this business, right? There's a lifestyle business, and projects that I'm passionate about that I don't need millions of dollars to succeed on, or my, my end goal is not IPO or $500 million sale or what, you know, it's just, it's just not that. So venture may not be the path for me because the question that venture investors always ask is what's the problem? And the next question is always, how big is it? And if that, if, if that question of how big it is, is not, doesn't start with a B, like a B, it's not billions instead of millions, it's an easy pass, right? Our job as venture investors <laughs> are to raise money to invest in startups to give a return to our investors, right? That's our fiduciary responsibility. And so, you know, we, it takes as much to look at one deal, you know, one deal that's going to return um, you know, a hundred dollars as a million dollars, right? So, you know, it's all going to take the same amount of work. So if the problem's not big enough and we can't figure out how to, how to, you know, how to, how to make money off of it, then it's, it doesn't mean it's not a, it's not a good problem to solve. It just doesn't mean it's a venture capital problem to solve. Right. So I would tell everyone on the phone, when you are thinking about your business or going to raise money what do you want from this, right? Lifestyle businesses are great. You can get a lifestyle business that's worth millions of dollars. That doesn't mean that you have to go get venture capital to do it. There's other ways to do that. Maybe that gets into, you know, maybe it's a grant, right? And maybe the grant is enough money to, to, to get you where, or maybe it's a small business loan, or maybe it's only $100,000 and, and you can go to an angel network or some, you know, or some other sort of smaller investors, or we can find a family office that, you know, that does smaller, you know, and that's okay. I mean, there, there are lots of, there's lots of different sources of capital. Venture capital sounds cool and sexy. It's just not for everyone. <laughs> and so that would be my advice is find out, ask yourself what you want from this business and how much money you think it's gonna, it's gonna, you're gonna need to solve that problem, and that's gonna direct you for sources of, of capital. Yeah, you know, you bring up such a good point. I even want to say on the flip side of that, um, sometimes, like you said, uh, VC and angel investing is this sounds so sexy, and people want to say they went on to raise money, um, but I think people don't even realize the amount of pressure that comes with that. Like, you know, I'm, I'm working with some people now in, in our in our most recent cohort, where he has a great idea, and if he didn't have venture capital. 
um, or if he didn't have, you know, vest, uh, investor money, you know, he could kind of take his time building his community at his own pace, right? But now it's just like, you have this investor money and they want cash on cash returns and they want certain milestones set. And it's kind of like what he could have done casually stress-free over maybe three to five years, he has to have it done in one year with a lot of stress and a lot of headache. Yeah, well, that's a good point to make. So, you know, to let you, you know, behind the curtain a bit. So, as I said, we take money from other people and we invest in startups and we are judged on a few things. And as Jeff said, cash on cash return. So how much did I invest versus the exit and how much am I giving back to my investors, right? And, and, and I'm also judged on investment rate of return. So the second that I take a dollar, right, that clock starts. And so the longer that dollar is at work, the lower that that investment rate of return is. So I'm also always trying to maximize the highest investment rate of return and the highest, you know, cash on cash return. And that always, that creates that pressure that Jeff's talking about, right? So clock starts to tick. And, you know, that's the thing that, that venture capital has. And so, you know, if you look at, again, grant money, or you look at angel investors, or you look at family offices, like I've had a family office say like, I don't ever have to go raise money. I'm rich forever. Right. I've got generational wealth. So, right. So I, I, my money can be much more patient because I don't have this clock, you know, and maybe there's an internal clock they have, but it's not like they're like, oh, I have to go raise another fund because again, I'm wealthy for a while, for a long time. Like I can't even spend this money. So, mm -hmm. you know, I think there are different sources of capital, like you said. So, you know, when we talk about grants and other, and other types of loans on, on the, on the side. So, you know, I would say, again, it comes back to that question that I asked before is what do you want? How much money do you need? And it's okay to take venture capital money. You just have to know what's, what's, what the risk and reward of that is, right? So the reward is I get, I get money to go grow my business. You know, the risk is, is that you, you're going to have people that the time, the time's ticking. So let's, let's get to growth. Let's get to scale. Let's get to all these other things to, you know, to, to maximize the investor return. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that, that makes a lot of sense, you know? And um, what I also would like to ask is, um, I mean, maybe not what I want to ask, but, you know, but do you, do you advise people to maybe just try to go as far as they can without raising capital, you know, once again, I think people sometimes think, you know, I'm, you know, they're trying to raise capital on day one. I think people don't even realize, you know, you might go out and do like a $2 million raise and you still can't even pay yourself a salary. Yeah. You know, so, so do I advise people to go as far as they can? Um, I will always say venture capital is not for everyone. And the, what, what happens when you take venture capital is that you give up equity for that for that cash right so you you know are sacrificing your ownership of your of your company for that cash to help your to, to help your business grow right and so there are you have to think about is this something that's that i think can be big and scalable and get to millions of dollars in revenue because i'm willing to i started out at 100 percent or 50 percent or whatever it is and as i you're constantly going to get diluted down based on the money that you're taking right so you're going to own less and less and less the goal is with that money revenues go up and up and up and up and up right you're able to be able to scale your business and come up and up so as you're as you go as you dilute your equity then the revenue goes up and then hopefully one day you sell it. Right. So who wouldn't want 1% of a billion dollars, right. Over a hundred percent of, you know, of a million dollars. <laughs> right. So, yeah. so that's the, you know, that's always the goal, but you have to balance. What am I willing to trade off to get to that end goal? And it, and it will come back and I'll sound like a broken record. What's the beginning goal, right? If, if your beginning goal is, you know, is I want to get to, you know, a company that's worth a hundred million dollars. That's good. If I, my beginning goals, I, I want to make a hundred thousand dollars a year in my business, a whole nother, that's a whole nother story. So. Mm -hmm. No, that's, that's good. That's good. And, you know, when, when we're talking about building a um, hundred million dollar businesses, once again, I know we're in this, this tech era where, um, you know, it sometimes feels like businesses are just, businesses are just blowing up overnight, which, which they do. But what, what, you know, can you maybe just speak to having this patience as an entrepreneur and building yourself, building yourself up, maybe building yourself slowly, 
et cetera. You have thoughts on that? Or are you all like, you know, are you very pro like blitz scaling and you got to get as big and fast as possible? Um, well, it depends. You're asking Sean, you're asking a venture capitalist. Like it depends what hat I'm wearing today. Right. So, uh, if my boss is listening, I want companies to get as big as possible, as fast as possible. Um, <laughs> uh, you know what I, what I would say to a family member or, um, you know, I would I would take a look at the business and what I what I want from it. And I know I've said that a, a few a few times before. There's when I've worked for other companies, we we've sort of had this debate internally when you look at strategy like reach versus revenue, right? And so, you know, how do I spend that money? How do I get customers? And it, it's going to depend on your business model. We haven't touched on that. You know, I think I think defining what your business model is very early on is is important. Are you going to sell to consumers? The, the second that the VC hears consumer, it sounds like we think about cost of customer acquisition or PAC, if you heard that, right? So if my business model is I'm going to sell to Joe American, right? And there's 300 million of them. Like that just sounds expensive. That sounds like TV and radio and influencer and like you name it, right? <laughs> right? So like it just sounds expensive versus like, okay, I'm going to sell to, and I'm making it up like logistics companies. So like, Less of them sounds like they have more money, you know, and how do I, you know, how do I get distribution to them? So I think, you know, one of the things we didn't talk is, is knowing your business model. Yeah, let's it's talk important. About it. Yeah, it's, it's, it's important. So knowing your business model, knowing the, the metrics around, around business model and distribution, I am a lifelong operator. Whenever I hear a pitch, I'm always thinking, how does this scale? Like that, that's the thing that like sticks into my mind. So how many customers do you have today? How do you acquire those customers today? What's it cost to, <laughs> what's it cost to get you one of those customers? Mm -hmm. what's, the, what's the lifetime value of those customers? Like if you can answer that, right? So those are some basic metrics that most VCs are gonna get. And then like, great, now how do we how do we 100X that, right? <laughs> and And is that, what kind of distribution partners are there? Is it a direct sales force? Are you going to sell on the web? All, all of these things that you have to, you have to, you have to talk yourself through and people pivot all the time on how they, on how they, you know, on how they do that. I, I started this conversation of, I like B2B, you know, we invest in B2B or B2B to C businesses, right? That doesn't mean that B2C businesses aren't great. And, you know, people don't make a lot of money. My background is like, if you can sell to businesses, that's less people to sell to and typically a higher volume, right? And so you can scale revenue faster, right? And so does it mean that that's the only way to get things done? But early stage entrepreneurs need to understand how am I going to distribute and scale because that's the way that I need to tell my story because that's the way we're going to get scale in two or three or four or five years instead of 15 or 20. And there's, there's plenty or, and that's the way it's not going to cost us, um, you know, millions and millions of dollars to reach every consumer on the face of the earth. Right. We just, we mm -hmm. don't have to, we don't. And that's why you hear about network businesses and network effect businesses and things like that is people are trying to figure out how to always acquire customers cheaper, better, faster, more. Right. And so yeah. the thing I think, you know, we venture is you know, raising venture funds is about storytelling. I tell people that all the time. Like, what story are you trying to tell, right? And if you're able to tell that in a coherent way um, to anyone that picks up your deck and explain that this is, here's the problem solution. Here's why the problem is big. Here's, you know, here's how I plan to, here's my business model. And most importantly, why are you the person to solve it? I tell people all the time, like, so I look at your team slide, like, why you? Like, this this idea isn't unique. It's not the first time. If you're building a better mousetrap, like, why are you the person and the only person? Tell me why you're the only person that can solve this, or you and your team are the only person that can solve this. Mm -hmm. Because at the end of the day, who are we investing in? We're investing in the people to execute on the big idea that they said that they have. And I, and I think you need to, you know, part of that is we talked a lot of things that you need to think about, but like, 
the story around why you mm -hmm. all the time. I, I, and I'll tell you a lot of times this, the, the first thing that comes to our mouth is, um, and I'm like, well, we're, we're not in a good place when, <laughs> when, you know, when you can't tell me why you are the only person on the face of the earth that can solve this. And maybe, you know, I'm being a little facetious on you're the only person on the face of the earth, but just why would I, why are you the one that I would trust with, with my investors? Mm -hmm. Does that make yeah. sense? No, that, make, that makes complete sense. That makes complete sense. Um, I wanted to ask you a question and it just left my mind. Um, but, you know, we, we could, um, uh, you know, someone asked a good question. Um, what about experimenting with business model? I, I just think that's relevant to what you're talking about right now. Yeah, so I, you know, I think we've all sort of maybe, maybe we haven't, but I, I won't assume, but we heard like sort of fail fast, right, as a founder. Mm -hmm. So I'm all for trying different things because you don't know. We, we we're alone in this vacuum. We've looked at our product or our deck or, you know, we, we think we're the smartest person in the room and we don't know until the customer tells us yes or no, <laughs> right? And mm -hmm. so I'm, I'm all for it in the, you know, in the beginning, in new products, like talk to your customers. They will tell you what they're willing to pay for, what they're not willing to pay for. Um, and, you know, and what business models work. And you could say like, you know, I think this is a business to business, you know, B2B model or b 2 b to c model or b 2 c model. Um, you're gonna have to get some traction somewhere. You're gonna have to talk to some customers. You're gonna have to do some pilots. You're gonna have to get some feedback. And let's say fail fast and leave your ego at the door. And I know you had this great concept that this was the way that it was gonna work, but your customers <laughs> tell you that it don't and, and don't be afraid to listen to them because because they're the ones that are going to pay for it and so i'm all for experimenting um but do get to your business model quickly because people are going to pressure test you on why why this model works and are people willing to pay for it and the only way to really show that is traction like i have proof that this business model works because people are willing to pay for it and here are the people willing to pay for it whether they're businesses or consumers mm -hmm. yeah no that's 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 a great point and um you know, just to segue a little bit, you know, I, I, of course, um, you know, funding rates are so low in our community, like you said, at the 2.6%. Um, do you have any thoughts around like, you know, what can people do as, um, what can they do as uh, individual entrepreneurs or, you know, teams to just put themselves in a better position to fundraise, whether it's, you know, is it just networking? Uh, maybe is there like some preliminary work, right? Like you were talking about, like, you know, just learning the game or refining your business. I don't know. I'm just want to get your two cents on that. Yeah, I, I think you want to remove the barriers. Why? So you have a barrier, your color, your skin. Like, let's just be honest, right? So, so that you're not going to be able to change. Everybody else, everything else can be modified, right? So I can modify my business model. I can modify my story. I can modify my product. I can modify all this other stuff, right? So... The one thing I can't, I can't, let's go, let's go with it. Right. So, um, but I would say leverage the other people around you that are in the situation that, that you are in. So you can not make the, you know, so you can minimize the mistakes that, that they made. I am happy. I tell people all the time, like I've been in business 23 years, I made lots of mistakes. There's lots of scars underneath the sweater. Right. And so I'm, I want to give back and say, look, here's the things that I've screwed up on. Like, don't you don't screw up on it. And and that is that is helpful um, to, you know, to go through because you've all done it. So you may have got to a VC that said no to you. Right. But in your network, you say, I just wasn't the right business model or I wasn't the right fit. But here are the questions that they asked. Here's what I wish I would have done. You know, I, I think we have to leverage the community that we have and our networks that we have and our networks networks again to help be as prepared as possible because I don't have the magic bullet. I've, I've, I've I asked for ten million dollars <laughs> at a time, right? And people say no. It does that whether you ask for ten dollars or ten million? You know, there's still the humbling experience of man, I wish I would have known that because they asked that question that I didn't know, right? And so I'm going to tell my friends, hey, before you go talk to this this person over here, like that's that's the thing. And so we, I know the community is small. It's getting bigger and bigger. I reach out to my peers all the time. Um, and I just try to 
I just try to network with their with their networks as well, and and it's the only way that I'm going to get better. Uh, it's the only way is that that I'm going to learn. It's it's what I've always done, and it's what I tell founders to do. Is that there's there's never been more founder information online than there is today. The problem is is that it's overwhelming, <laughs> right? So so like, geez, what what's a deck template that I use, and what like what should my uh, pro forma look like and what you know and you could go and there's just pages and pages and pages of information so it's sifting through that information and and you know trying to to get to people that have gone through it before uh, and, and help you out uh, you know i'm part of black vc and i call up some of my colleagues and i was like well, how do you deal with this because you dealt with it you know this other person can you introduce me to somebody can you you know and it's just like there's only 3% of investors that are black. And so it's a, it's a small community, just like 3%, you know, go. So it's the, the numbers are the same across the board, whether you're an investor or whether you're a founder, right? But I do have some hope that the community is tight and it's getting incrementally bigger <laughs> as, we, as we move forward. Um, but people are much, I, I think, are just willing to share a lot of information because you know, because that's, that's the case and, and we just want to help each other. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. And, um, you know, just, just to segue into another question, like what you're bringing up, do you have any thoughts on, you know, um, just creating better access to investor education as a means of, you know, creating more black VCs or even creating more um, angels, angels of color, um, female um, women investors, et cetera? It's a question I've struggled with for years. <laughs> I mean, like it's a, you know, I think after last summer, I was like, what do I do? I was like, I just overwhelmed. And, and I didn't do it. It's like, I got to the point where, you know, we talked about this, Jeff, where I was like, I don't even know what to do. Like, there's too much to do. I want to help everybody. And like, you just get this feeling of like overwhelmed and like, and you shut down. <laughs> right. So, <laughs> you know, I was like, so how do I, I don't, and I was like, okay, I know the one thing I can do is give time. Right. Like that's free. Um, and I can and I can do that, and I can try and I can try to try to help. And I think a lot of people have gotten to that point where you know I, th I think you just you are just trying to help move forward. And how, no matter how small the community is, you know I, I think it's tight knit, and and you you know and you keep going. I would say you know just your question around. How do people get to the larger network? I mean, Jeff, we've, we've talked about bringing people in as investors that never were investors before. So, mm -hmm. you know, can you, can we educate uh, people that didn't think investment was the, the path or, you know, to get, to get more people in or to have access for investors to do smaller checks than, you know, a half a million dollars, like, can we get professionals of color to, you know, to be angel investors at ten thousand dollars, twenty five thousand dollars, fifty thousand dollars, you know? And that's, I think, the way that you know that it starts. You know, I struggled. I was like, well, do I have to go to like elementary schools and tell people they could be entrepreneurs? <laughs> like, you know, do I have to go to middle school or do I go to Chicago public school system and and do that? And and you know, just talking to my peers. I was like, we just have to educate. Like, we have to do things like this. Uh, mm -hmm. We have to, we have to find ways for people to know that that this is a possibility. Because as I said, like, I had no idea it was a possibility. If you'd have told me, you know, you told twenty one year old Sean he's going to be a venture capitalist, I was just like, I don't even know what you're talking about. <laughs> so, um, somebody at some point along the line said that to you. So, or said that to me, and and then I. You know, then I had it as as a, as a chance to to do that, but uh, you know, I don't have the right answer, Jeff. I wish I had. I wish I had something eloquent to tell you that that uh, you know that we can. It just takes time, and it and it takes effort, and it takes intentionality by all of us on the phone and and our partners that aren't on the phone to mm -hmm. to do that. I mean, I've what I've done is most people of not that most white people said to me like what what do i do how do i help mm -hmm. i said just be around when i come when i when i and i said look you can do a couple things you can write a check 
everybody, you know, if you can do that, you can write a check to um, give your time and effort. It doesn't cost anyone to, to do that. And so I do think it's engaging partners. And, and one of the things that I wanted to talk about today was when you're a founder, just like everyone else, you surround yourself with people that are like you, right? We all do that. We surround ourselves with sort of, I say, find co-founders, find advisors, find other people that have skill sets that you don't have, right? And that's, you know, the biggest thing I can tell because they have networks that you don't have, they have skill sets you don't have, and together you are better than, you know, than, than on your own. And you're just not going to wake up one day and have this huge network of, of VC professionals. Like it's just not going to happen. So, but people that, you know, and people that they know, and, and, you know, if you surround yourself with people that have different skill sets or networks than you, you can start to build that over time, but you have to start yesterday, last week, last year, you know, and, and do that. So I would tell any founders, I would start talking to series B people today, <laughs> like just meet them. You know, like I may be, a, I may be an early stage, but it's going to take you years of a relationship because people invest in people they like and who they know, you know, like we're never going to change that. Mm -hmm. And so if you don't start creating relationships for five years down the line, I told you my job, I met someone, I was like, one day I'm going to work for you. It's not going to be tomorrow. I'm okay with that. Tell me the barriers that I need to overcome and I'll see you in a few years from now. And that was very intentional on my part is one of the things I need to know and whether you're, you know, I think you need to do that. We need to do that just in general as meet as many people as you can. And even if the, even if it's not for now, it may help out you and your next business five years mm -hmm. from now or 10 years from now. Yeah, no, that's, that's great. That's great. And, um, you know, you, you mentioned like, you know, getting people started with smaller check sizes and that's a very real thing with, um, equity crowdfunding today, right? Like, yeah. um, people can go and make, um, investments in technology companies with as little as 500 bucks or a thousand bucks on platforms like, um, Republic. I know there's equity Zen. There's just so many platforms out there for, um, for equity crowdfunding. And, um, I think it's just really about teaching people maybe like, um, a process, right. You know, if you, you know, whether it's, you're investing $10 million or $1,000 or $500, right? You need a process of identifying a company that you understand, you know, maybe going through their business model, vetting their team, um, doing competitive analysis, you know, and then now you're at a place where, you know, you may not have the most money in the world, but at least you have a process for identifying an opportunity. And then, you know, through crowdfunding, at least you could act on that opportunity at your, um, at your check size. Yeah, and I'll, I'll give you the plug for you know for grants uh, uh, .io. I mean that, that's I love that. Like I, you know even for my own things that I, that I look at, like there's there's free money out there, um, you know, and there's lots of attention on minority founders um, today. There's never been more attention than today, and so when I keep saying that now is the best time, uh, take advantage of it because who knows how long it's going to last. Uh, <laughs> you know, it you, we see it as you know, I, I never know. So I'd say, do, do it now, do it yesterday. Um, go be aggressive, go be intentional uh, because you just don't know. Mm -hmm. you know. The markets will change, the stock market could change, equities could change and all that stuff trickles down to, to start up founders. And so there's just more money than there's ever been. So start the preparation if you haven't now and, and you know, happy to be a resource. And I know what Jeff and your group does and there's, there's just more resource and more, more money than there's ever been. So it is a good time. It's discouraged as, as you can get. Um, there, you know, I, I, I am positive about at least the momentum that, that's happening. Okay. Yeah, no, that's great. You, you gave us some great points. Um, before we get into Q&A, uh, can you maybe just give us um, a few resources just to learn more about the venture capital industry or, you know, books to read, et cetera? Yeah, well, I'll, why don't I send you some stuff? I don't have it prepared um, okay. right now, but Jeff, maybe I'll, I'll send you a few things and you can distribute it to the group and we'll, we'll, you know, break it down to some categories. I'm sorry. I don't have it like just off the top of my head, but I want to be, I want to be, uh, yeah, I, I, I want to be uh, just careful. Well, I'm not careful, but, but I want to, I want to just get it in the right, in the right places. So I yeah. think there's some for founders, some for VCs and, and I'll, I'll provide that and you can maybe send it out to the group. 
Yeah, yeah, we, we actually do follow up emails um, after every event. So yeah, you, you can send that and we'll send that over, but I'll just drop a few. Okay. <laughs> um, someone right. in the group chat actually uh, recommended a book called Venture Deals by Brad Feld. Uh, I think that's a great book. I've read that yeah. personally, and I've, yeah. I've been recommending that to our cohorts. Um, that book really teaches you the ins and outs um, of venture deals, what goes into it, what goes into the um, into the contracts, what goes into the term sheets, um, what are the different, uh, what's the term that I'm looking for? It just gives you the full in and outs. Um, another resource that I think is good is um, the National Venture Capital Association. Yeah, NBCA, oh, yep, sorry, and yep, yeah. That, is it dot org? Uh, I don't know, I, I don't know if it's dot org or dot com, but it's probably dot org, but yeah, they have, and I had the link, Jeff, I could send it to you where you have the link to all the documents that are standard. So it's a great, it's a great call out. So the National Venture Capital Association that, you know, they'll give you some templates for term sheets and, and, um, and some notes, convertible notes and other things that, you know, that you can start to, to look at. There we go. Somebody put it in there. So yeah, nbca.org. So that's a great one. Um, I have read venture deals. I just think there's venture for dummies. There's all sorts of, you know, there's all sorts of, uh, you know, venture, um, you know, information out there. I would say, you know, as I got into it again, I, I came in and I was like, I, it's like, I would say just break it off to the things that, that you um, don't get overwhelmed because you can start to get into, find out what stage you're in and, you know, we can concentrate on sort of where you are, but uh, I think it can be overwhelming to get all of those terms. Uh, it's like going back to college and, <laughs> and, and trying to figure out there are some, there are some, you know, major things that you're going to need at different stages. And so, you know, Jeff, sort of happy. I know we've done for your cohorts before, like gone through term sheets, what's important, what's not important. I think that's a longer conversation, but Mm -hmm. you know, providing that information and I'm happy to, to, to uh, like have some resources to be able to help do that. So I think education is, is, is key to, uh, you know, to getting people access there, because if you don't know, you, you know, not, you can be taken advantage of it at certain points, just because for anything, doesn't matter what the contract says, whether it's for your car repair or whether it's for venture capital, if, if you're not an expert or close to it, uh, you don't know what all the terms mean, right? So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, so those are some great resources and we look forward to you following up. So um, sure. let's let's hop into questions. Um, Keith Keith Kirkland, Kirkland, do you have a question? Um, I'll unmute you. You had a question around sales. I'll just unmute you to let you ask it out loud. Um, I just gotta find you in all these participants. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know if Keith is still in here. Um, yeah, he is. I just sent yeah. the request to him. Yeah, um, yeah, I'm here. Hey, Sean, how's it going? Hey, Keith. Um, What's Keith up? Kirkland here from where it works. Um, I was oh, curious. Hey. <laughs> 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 so I was, I was really curious around and like getting a deeper understanding into your your sales background. Uh, just for the record, you know, like. I've met Sean already. We've had a few conversations before. Um, and get digging into your sales background for companies that, because you know, like especially at your at your stage, sales is a really big part of the conversation at Series A. It's basically mm -hmm. mainly the main part of the conversation at Series A. Mm -hmm. um, but as startups, of course, we're focused on the product, getting the customers, doing the marketing, building a brand, like getting the right people. So I feel like in our case in particular, we've neglected sales or that focus on sales the way we focused on product. And I'm curious if you have any thoughts from a point of view of entry points, like where do you start to build that, that you know, like that experimental channel where you're figuring out what works and you're systematizing it and scaling it? Yeah, I mean, there's an, I used to tease, you know, I, I had, I've always been in sales, so it's always been in front of my mind. I used to tease my developers. I was like, you guys can, you know, nobody has a job unless somebody sells something is the old adage, right? So you could build the best product. It could be the sexiest thing out there, sliced bread, but if no one can sell it, then, you know, then it's hard to have a company. So I think you have to think about that early on. And as you're, especially if you're a, a product forward company, like, you know, Keith is and, and you I think it's more around distribution and, and how am I going to distribute this product? And then that will inform you what type of sales channel that you need, 
right? And I, I like, and I know a Keith's product, so he has a wearable and, you know, he's, he's now, is he going to sell that to the Nikes of the world, right? Or is he going to sell that directly to Joe consumer, right? And that's just a different, and it's a different model. And we talked about maybe you test something out and, and a lot of times, am I going to sell it on the web? Am I going to sell it through partners? And so, you know, the question of when do you start to think about sales, I, you know, I, I think about it from the second I think about a business idea is how am I going to sell this thing? Um, as a product person, you're like, how am I going to build this thing? <laughs> right? So it's a little bit of both, right? It's a chicken and the egg, right? Because you got to build, you know, you got to build something to sell it. So I would, you know, I would certainly think about what is the scalable business model for, for us to distribute our product? And that will back you into what are the right channels or approaches or people or to, to sell that product through. Does that make sense? Like I, I, I really think that you have to, you have to define that a bit because that's going to determine, do I need someone or do I have to have internal expertise to someone that knows how to sell this to brand apparels? Or do I need a marketing person that's good in e-commerce? Right. And that's like, it's, uh, or is that a skill set we have to have internally or go hire for? And so, you know, it does come back to how am I going to, how am I going to distribute this product and what business model? And that will determine sort of, I think, sales strategy. Yeah, that, that was a great question and great answer. Thank you, Keith. Um, we have another really good question from Cassandra. It seems like Cassandra is a, a VC startup. So Cassandra, we're going to give you the floor to ask your question. Hello, thanks for being here, Sean. Yeah. And so I started a VC firm or small business um, for, I guess, flat owned. So I'm basically investing my own money and falling set for a family owned. So what advice would you give like a family owned startup VC? Cause I'm bootstrapping the whole thing. So basically I put 25 K in it roughly. And so I'm funding other people's, you know, startups with that. Okay. So early stage, early, early stage checks into small businesses. Is that, am I, did I understand that right? Um, uh, diversify, <laughs> I would say like, you know, as a, as a venture capitalist, as, as any investor, um, you know, you want to diversify your investments to, to alleviate risk. What, what we do is risky, right? So there's, Lots of different approaches to it. There is, I'm going to write small checks to a hundred people. And if two of those hundred people work, then, you know, and I own a big percentage, then it'll work for me. Or I only write 10 checks and I write 10 big checks and I have conviction. Um, there's an inherent failure rate. So, you know, you want to, you want to protect your downside risk. I'm talking Jeff's language right now. So, you know, you, you want to, you want to make sure you do that. Um, and I would say you know, define your investment process, right? Because a lot of times, if you're small, if you know the people really well, you sort of have to take emotion out of it, right? So you're investing in people, you may know those people, you may be swayed by by those people. I've known this person, we grew up together. And so I know a hard of a worker that she is. And so I'm going to give her, you know, but so I can't tell you how to run your business, but I can tell you, you know, from a general perspective to make sure you know, that you have a process and as objective a, a process in place and the things that are important to you, you know, from your investment thesis, and I don't know what that is, um, maybe specialize a bit in an area that you have expertise in. So, you know, we, we are very domain specific. You, you pick up some pattern recognition after a while, right? I've seen this business model. I've seen this, I've seen this movie before. I know how it ends. <laughs> so, so I, I don't have to watch the whole thing because I know how it ends. Um, and so I, you know, I would say as a, you know, as an early stage investor, you don't have that much information. And so, you know, a lot of it is gut feeling, but you're going to have to get as much, get as much science as you can. Cause you know, the art is hard. It's hard. So I, I, would, I would do that, but good luck to you. Yes, that's an, another great question as well. Thank you, Cassandra. And Cassandra, we should we should connect. I would love to learn more about what you have going on. Um, Azure um, had a question 
Uh, what's your take on accelerators? Let me un unmute Azure. Yeah, so was, was that the question? Uh, hi, greeting. I can add a bit of context to that. I'm currently, I'm a founder and I'm trying to create a strategy for my dilution long-term. Mm -hmm. um, currently I'm considering or interviewing different programs that are accelerator-esque. Um, and I think right now negotiations looking like 10% or lower in terms of equity exchange. Mm -hmm. You've mentioned a lot of cost and benefit um, in terms of VC involvement, but you haven't really discussed any, it's not your background, I suppose, but you didn't mention anything in terms of like, um, I guess the similar pressures or equity returns and what have you in being involved with an accelerator program. So do you have anything to comment on that and comparing the different sources of capital? Yeah, so uh, I failed to mention that I run our accelerator. So, so uh, I have lots of experience on accelerator negotiations um, from one side. That's probably a long, a longer conversation. I'm sort of happy to take that that offline because I think there's a lot of um, there's a lot of benefit. Um, there's certainly dilution. Uh, the question, in just in general, and and again, I'm happy to take it offline is. What skill, like, what am I trying to accomplish? And some, and what are they, what is the offer that they're, they're giving me and sort of what stage, what help do I need at, at this certain stage? I would say sometimes you're too early, sometimes you're too late, sometimes a different accelerator is better for you. Sometimes it's about fundraising, sometimes it's about customers, sometimes it's about product market fit. So there are so many variables. People say like, oh, would you do this deal? And I was like, I don't know what the terms are. So like, <laughs> you're asking me a question without, without the context. Um, accelerators are hugely beneficial to the right company at the right time. Uh, many of the billion dollar companies you've seen have gone through them. Uh, there are downsides and risks of all of them. Uh, I'd love to take it offline. I'm happy to, to talk to anyone about, about that and just give you my personal opinion. Um, but there's probably just more things that, that you need to know, but ask yourself in general, what am I looking to get out of it? What are they looking to get out of it? And are these the right people at the right time? And do those incentives line up at the, at the same time for me, for us? Yes, um, excellent question and ex excellent response. You guys are on a roll. Um, Francesca OJ, she just uh, wanted to say amazing conversation and thank you for being here, Sean. So just giving you that quick shout out. Oh, thanks for having me. Yep, yep. Um, Jess actually left. Um, Jess just wrote me saying that they were leaving, but uh, I'll ask the question anyway. Um, okay. Best advice to overcome the defeated attitude when approaching an investor to raise money? Any, mem any memorable rebounds from resilient founders that you've worked with? <laughs> Every founder is, is resilient. If they if they raise the money, they have to be resilient. I mean, it is it's worse than dating at a bar. It's worse than being on Tinder. It's you know it's oh no. it's, it's it's a lot. Well, especially for me, so I don't get a lot of yeses. But anyway, but you know, um, when you, I you know, I was talking to someone today, and again, it's about preparedness. So when you come in, and if your story. You know, if you're confident in your story, you've talked to some other folks, you've gotten some feedback, maybe some mentorship, maybe some other things. I think you just have to, you have to be confident. There's so many stories of billion dollar companies that got 300 no's, you know, the Peloton story, you know, others of like hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of no's for the yes. And it just takes one person to say yes. And it takes the right person to say yes. And so, you know, I know it sounds a little corny, but it, it's about preservation. People can see in your face when you're defeated before it starts. I can tell when someone's <laughs> when when someone is like, "Oh, this is I'm doing this because I because I need to do it," and I told myself I would do it. I can tell you, well, Keith is on the phone here, and I, the first time I talked to Keith, like I was like, "Wow," I was like. I don't know how many times Keith has told that story, but I was like, I, I'm, I'm very rarely blown away by people's personal story and how it relates to what, they, what they've what they done. And I think he, he told it to me, it's probably, he'll tell you how many hundreds of times he told that story. It sounded like the first time he told the story. And, you know, that was, that was for me, at least as an investor, as I was like, when, when we asked the question of like, why is this guy the guy or why is this gal the gal? Like, I was like, he's the guy. <laughs> right. And it, and so 
I'm sure he's been told no a hundred times, but it wasn't about being told no. He didn't know me. I didn't know him, but we, you know, we had this conversation and walked away and, and, and that was it. So how do you get over it? You pick yourself up like everything else in life, <laughs> you dust yourself off and it's your business and no one loves your business as much as you love your business, right? No one is as passionate about your business as you are. We get a little bit of rose colored glasses on our own business because we're so close to it and it's our baby and, you know, and, but that happens. So I'd say be objective. You know, I would say take feedback. I would say ask for feedback when someone tells you no. Sometimes you get it, sometimes you won't. Put your founder ego aside. We all have egos when we're founders, right? Because, you know, we had to to go do this. But show your passion. Uh, it's it, it comes through. And, and I know it's hard sometimes, but it's it's refreshing to see. Yep. No, that, that was a great answer. Um, unfortunately, Jess isn't here, but uh, okay. great answer to, to the question. <laughs> Um, Matt had a question for you. Um, do you think it's, oh, excuse me, let me unmute Matt because Matt is still here. Uh, Matt, you can ask your question. Okay. Hi, uh, my name is Matt. Uh, I actually was like um, a mentor to one of your, I think she works at the New York Development Corporation. Is like Lauren. She was, she was a great mentor. And uh, I just wanted to point out to you, Sean, uh, thank you also for, um, with all your information and everything. Um, in starting like a small business, because for me, I'm still in the beginning. Um, is it better to like have like work experience and then wait later on, or is it does it, it doesn't really matter when beginning a small business like experience? Uh, I think that comes back to the question of founder. Like if if you if you want to go raise money from someone else, you need to tell the story of why you're the person, right? And if you haven't, if you don't have expertise in the subject matter then maybe you go find a co-founder <laughs> that does, right? So, you know, I would never want to start a business, at, you know, in in auto repair because I pay someone to do all that stuff for me, right? So I wouldn't be the guy if I was starting, you know, now I may be the guy that helps the auto repair company scale, right? Because that's my that's my expertise. I think, I think it's always scary to start your own business, Matt, no matter if it's a small business, no matter if it's a venture back business, it's always scary to go out on your own. People need to be prepared for the financial, you know, implications of, of doing their own business. Fundraising, if you're going to do that, Matt, always takes longer. It's always harder than you think it's going to be. Your business always takes longer and harder than, than it always, it's always harder and takes longer to scale than you thought it would. Um, very few of us, uh, are surprised by how fast things go and how much money is pouring in. Um, but I would, I would tell you like, you know, have some expertise if it, it, at least in your field before you go, you know, before you go do that. Oh, can I also ask one more question or? Yeah. Uh, last question is if experience, have you ever like encountered, like, does it make sense to try to get uh, funding? Like for example, here in the U S and then bring it, to a different country does that make any sense or is it better to stay within like domestically like for example um one of the issues uh like for example in the philippines like i came from the philippines um there's not one of their issues is what they don't have enough funds like people to invest in small startups and oh, we're also slow yeah. low in startups and it's we're risk averse that's based on my understanding does it make sense to like bring have you ever or have you ever experienced like from here in the US bring money in like funds to like invest in small startup or are they like when it comes to small when it comes to countries like in the Philippines small startups outside the US it's a bit too risky or yeah that... I would I would you know I've certainly experienced with international I'd say a lot of times what what happens is people prove their business model in their home country and then they look to the US as the sort of big market whether that's LATAM or whether it's Asia Pacific or whether it's you know whether it's the UK or Europe, you know, I would say a lot of times your your best your best hope of getting funding is in your home country because you're typically probably solving a local problem, right? And U.S. investors are like, you know, hey, I I, I think it's a big problem in Mexico. I'm just, I just don't know Mexico or I don't know Colombia or I don't know somewhere else. So I would get traction in your home company in your home country before you before you tried to get U.S. investment. It's just going to be easier. Okay, thank you. Yep. Yep. Great. Great question, Matt. Um, Francesca has a question. We're not a much unmute you, Francesca. 
Hello, everyone. Hi, Sean. Thank you so much for being here today. Learned a lot from you. Um, And I'm very um, inspired by you because I'm in actually in the sales industry. I've been in like the fintech industry for about four years. And now I'm in like uh, the tech software sales industry. So I don't know if you discuss this because I've been working in and out. Um, But I would love to know how did you transition from like enterprise sales to venture capitalists? I don't know if you spoke about this. No, I mean, I I think part of enterprise sales, you know, when I got into enterprise sales was I was in a particular industry and I networked my way, you know, in that industry. And I said, part of enterprise sales was I needed to know all the C-level people in, in, you know, in that industry, right? So who do I know that's going to get me to sea level because I'm going to have to talk to them anyway. Right. And I started building up this network over a decade of the sea level folks at a bunch of different firms um, that I was selling into. And part of my pitch to the venture capital is, Hey, your companies need to sell to these people that I know already. So I can help you and your portfolio companies meet these people negotiate with these people and contract with these people and probably implement because I've already done it before. And that was an, that was a pretty easy sell for me to, because she was like, Oh, great. Well, like, that's what we need. <laughs> so, so that was the way that I did it was to, when you, when, if you can find an opportunity that leverages your skill set and your network, then again, that, that brings down the barrier for them to say no. And it, it's just, it's being very deliberate and, and how you're going to get there. And it, it took me a, a while. It wasn't, you know, I didn't, I didn't get there in a year or two, but I said, if, you know, when you can start to build up a network, people will pay you for that network, you know, especially when you're at the C level and where you are in tech sales, if it's CTO or CIO or, you know, or other people, you know, or head of IT or those other, you know, those are, those are valuable to other companies. And so you can leverage those, you know, for career changes. Yeah, you're welcome. Uh, That that was a great question and answer. Um, Before we wrap up, does anyone else have some last questions? You can raise your hand or just. um... Yes, yes, Matt, you can you can uh, add me on LinkedIn. Yes, Um, Ismail, would you mind dropping Sean's um, LinkedIn in this chat, if that's okay? Sure. I will try to get through them as yeah as quick as possible. Um, you know, part of part of me doing this is is I talked to you about access. Um, I'm passionate about it. Jeff and I talk about it all the time. I said Jeff, use me, however you can. Um, I've been very fortunate in my career to have other people give me information, give me mentorship, and, and I'm happy to to you know to do that for others and pay it forward. Excellent, excellent. You know, and um, and that's what we need in our community. You know, um, the people who know, making sure that we're going back and and you know, um, just bringing that that knowledge and the education to the people who don't know. Um, so thank you for that. So um, I don't think we have any last questions. So you know, I think we could wrap up here. Just want to say thank you so much, everybody, for joining us. Uh, just a little, few little housekeeping things. Um, uh, Isma, if you don't mind, maybe just put the incubator website on the the chat. If you guys want to learn more about the incubator, feel free to visit the website. We will send a follow-up email, like like Isma just said, with the recording, resources, our contact info, Sean's contact info. Um, I am a resource and at everyone's disposal. Um, Sean is making himself available as well. I don't want to say that he's at everyone's disposal, <laughs> but um, Sean is yeah. available. I, I will get back as time permits. So I just uh, a qualifier there. Yes, I will connect with everyone. I promise. Just tell me that you met me in this forum and I promise I'll, I'll connect. So. Excellent, excellent. So, um, yeah, I just maybe want to give you a chance to maybe make some closing remark, remarks, Sean, before we go. Be intentional, be aggressive, um, pick yourself up, uh, network like crazy, and and good luck. I mean, I, I think it's is because uh, it takes luck too. So, but it takes all those other things too. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. So, um. Thank you all. Thank you everybody for attending. And, um, you know, I'm sure we'll all be in touch and have a great evening. Yeah. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Bye.